Okay, um, hello everybody, you're all very welcome to this, our second um, CDSI uh, Dante Dialogue. Um, I'm just going to, yeah. Um, and personally, I'm very, very excited about this one um, as we're kind of really putting together two separate, seemingly diverse uh, volumes in dialogue with one another. So this should be very, very interesting. And trust me, if you haven't uh, yet had the opportunity to do so, please read them because they both of them are truly, trually original, intellectually stimulating. Uh, and in, in the case of one of them, very deliberately, it, it's also a great feast for the eyes and it's going to communicate in, in, in a very different way as well. Now, in addition, this dialogue allows us to welcome back to University College Cork, albeit virtually, uh, two dear friends uh, of the Centre for Dante Studies, that is Heather Webb and George Corbett, who have both participated in our annual Dante Lecture Series in the past, and Heather has also played a significant role in David Bow and uh, Federico Coluzzi's Mediating Dante project back in 2019. Uh, correct me if I've got the year wrong there, David. Uh, so I'm delighted that they can uh, both be with us today. And it's also a genuine pleasure to welcome Simone Marchese with us today. Uh, and in this special uh, Dante year, um, you know, make new friends. And uh, Simone is talking to us from the US and we really appreciate him uh, coming in early, even if he did spill coffee all over his office uh, this morning. Um, yes, yeah, so before I pass over to Heather, um, who is essentially the boss today uh, of our dialogue, um, I just want to briefly introduce our guest because it would be remiss of me not to do so. Um, most of you know already know who, who, who they are, but I, I will say a few words. Uh, George Corbett is Senior Lecturer in Theology and the Arts at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, and has two principal areas of research, theology and the arts, with a focus there on Dante, um, and also the systematic and historic, uh, systematic and historical theology with a focus on Aquinas's theology and also Catholic theology post-Vatican II. Uh, George directs, and you're going to correct my pronunciation. Is it do you, do you pronounce it Kephas or Cephas? I can't hear you, George. You're muted. Um, we tend to say Cephas, even though Kephas is obviously the more correct pronunciation. Okay, Cephas, which is the Thomistic Centre for Philosophy and Scholastic Theology, and also the Artistry, which is a project linking uh, of theologians and artists. Um, among his many, many publications, I should mention Dante and Epicurus from Legenda 2013, and his most recent volume, and the reason why we're here really today is Dante's Christian Ethics and its Moral Context, and that was published uh, late last year in 2020 by Cambridge University Press. Simone Marchese is Associate Professor of French and Italian at Princeton University. His uh, main research area is essentially the dialogue with classical and late antique texts engaged by medieval um, Italian writers, especially Dante, Petrarca and Boccaccio. Uh, he's published a great deal uh, on medieval authors, including two monographs, one Stratigraphie uh, de Camoroniane, uh, Olski in 2004, and Dante and Augustine um, Linguistics, Poetics and Hermeneutics with the, published by the University of Toronto Press in 2011. He's also the current editor of the Electronic Bulletin uh, of the Dante Society of America. And in collaboration with the artist and illustrator Roberto Abbiati, he has produced this wonderful and quite unique and original A Proposito di Dante, Cento Passi nella Commedia, published by Keller Editore, uh, again 2020. And finally, our mediator for today, Heather Webb, is a reader in medieval Italian culture and literature uh, at the University of Cambridge, and she has a particular interest in poetry, uh, theology, philosophy, and visual culture. And she's the author of The Medieval Heart, Yale University Press 2010, and also Dante's Persons and Ethics of the Transhumans of Oxford University Press there in 2016. And with George, uh, uh, she's also the editor, uh, co-editor of the wonderful vertical readings in Dante's comedy that was published over three volumes between 2015 and 2017. So before I pass over to Heather, I just one or two housekeeping notices. This dialogue is being recorded. So uh, if you don't want anyone to know that you're here, please turn off your camera. Uh, you can leave it on if you want. But if you haven't already done so, could I ask you all except the speakers uh, to mute your microphones? Uh, 
uh, for this part of the dialogue. A little later, Heather will, will, will open it up uh, to the floor and you can ask questions and make your own contributions at that point. As we said at the beginning of our series, our idea for these dialogues is to really encourage communication and an exchange of ideas. So when we say Dante dialogue, what exactly do we mean? And as I said the last time around, imagine you're not all speaking into a screen, but you're in a nice cozy Irish pub um, and thereupon, well, that's the nearest we get to it. And we all you know, hit on a topic and each person speaks passionately about their particular take on that topic, holding their own ground, but allowing dialogue to flourish. So this is our real hope for the series. Uh, and I also should add that when each has had their time and they have dialogued also with one another, that uh, we genuinely, genuinely hope that you, the audience, will join in and contribute to the discussion. So with it, I'll pass over to you now, Heather and Philip Barola. Just, hold on two seconds. Just there we go. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Dara. It is such a pleasure to be here, even if virtually, with you all. Um, and uh, encounters at UCC are always the most challenging, stimulating, and uh, collegial of them all. And so I'm really, really pleased to be here in whatever way the pandemic makes possible. Um, and it is a challenge this time, um, that's for sure. There's no question about that. I had a giggle initially when my, uh, <laughs> when my friends at Cork sent me the challenge of these two books, because really, I think you cannot find two books on Dante that are more different than the two that we have for today. And so the challenge was presented to me something as like, well, we'll see what we can, we can bring together here, um, which has been great, great fun to think about. Um, I think we're going, we're going to let these two books be as different as they are. And yet I think there will be lots, it turns out, lots of points for dialogue that will emerge uh, between them. So um, I'm going to begin with uh, the preface to Simone's book, if I may. And I'm just going to read out to you all a little bit from that preface, which reports uh, an email exchange between Simone and Bob Hollander. Simone is going to intervene. Yeah, may, may I share the screen? I have the English original. Oh, fantastic. Please Let do. Me see. Let me see if I can do that. I'll be reading from the Italian because that's what I have yep. in my hands, but... Can you see? Yes, excellent. Perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm going to highlight, I'm not going to read the entire exchange, I'm going to highlight a few lines from this, which I think will be a, provide an excellent way into our discussion. Hollander writes, Devo confessare che non mi sono mai piaciute le illustrazioni dei libri di poesia, che sono oggetti per loro natura esteticamente autosufficienti. E questo mi sembra vero nella maniera più assoluta per Dante. Mi posso solo immaginare che cosa potrebbe dire di un progetto come questo. Scusami, ma questo è quello che penso. And the response from Simone is the other bit I wanted to, uh, to get into here. Sono perfettamente d'accordo, says Simone. La poesia di Dante è costruita per creare delle immagini mentali e co con che potenza lo fa, mentre tutte le illustrazioni tradiscono questo mandato, sostituendosi ai lettori. È per questo che Abbiati e io stiamo cercando di esprimere graficamente non tanto quello che la poesia di Dante dice, ma quello che fa. And that's where I thought it would be really, really useful to begin. Um, because, you know, um, maybe trying to help me, my colleagues at UCC have titled this encounter Approaches to Dante, right? Um, how are we going to bring these two things together, Approaches to Dante? And I think this brings up a, uh, a joke we had in grad school when we, you know, students would meet from the arts and humanities vaguely and we would talk to one another when someone would say, what, were you work what are you working on? And you'd give the subject and they'd say, and what is your approach with all that seriousness that only, um, you know, early years of study can bring on? And so we would come back with stealthy. Just the variety of approaches to Dante is so many. And this, but this brings up a really important question, I think, the encounter with uh, this email exchange with Hollander. And this question of like, what can you do with the poem? What are the ways in which we um, can work with the poem? Because I think there is a thread running through Simone, if I may venture this in your book about this kind of the question of 
the maestro, the father figure, paternities. It appears in various places in the book, this question of the kinds of guides that we need and what sort of guidance we need for reading the poem. Um, I, I found it's a question that appears again and again throughout uh, your commentaries as they appear here. And it did seem to me to be a question that might link up some of the issues that emerge from both of these books. George's work looks into the question of guidance as well. What sort of guidance uh, does the pilgrim need? What sort of guidance does the soul need? What kind of pastoral guidance does the poem provide? George suggests various different forms of guides. Uh, there's, a, there's a wonderfully in-depth discussion about whether we're talking more about Aquinas when we should be talking about Peraldus. Um, what exactly is Virgil's authority and where, what does Virgil lack? How do we deal with these father figures? It's a massive question in Dante studies. It's one that goes on and on and on in various different ways. And it articulates itself, not just within the poem, how does Dante deal with his own father figures about which much has been written, but also how do Dante critics and emerging Dante critics and Dante readers who are establishing their own critical voices, how do they deal with this, these vast masses of father figures um, that go before? And I keep saying father figures because most of the time they are, but how do we deal, of course, with <laughs> women in this as well? This is another question that emerges. So um, how does all of this fit in? I think both of, both of these works raise uh, questions about how open is the poem? Are there moments when we need to consider broad structures? Are there moments when we can just dive in? What is lost or what is gained by taking the broad view or the pilula, as Simone was saying uh, earlier um, in kind of informal conversation before we, before we started. Cento passi nella commedia, their tastes, there are these little sweet, <laughs> but perhaps also <laughs> nutritional uh, ways in, right? So I think George's approach, there was something really fascinating um, that George said in his, the opening to the book, it comes quite early on, page 18. George says, look, I'm going to be looking, and permit me to paraphrase you, George, you can correct me momentarily. Um, George says, look, I'm going to be looking at structures. I want to look at the big picture. I'm going to be pulling back and doing this work of showing you what I understand to be these overarching structures for, and then George does for Inferno, for Purgatorio, for Paradiso, we get moral structures and schemes, right? But George, you make the very important point that what you're doing is not the reader's experience, right? That for the reader, instead, there's a sense of progressive building, there's a sense of surprise, that the reader who encounters the poem for the first time, or even if not for the first time, but without yet all of the baggage that will come later, there's a lot of surprise into how things are set out, the kinds of sins one encounters in what order, the sorts of things that are happening. Um, and I think the element of surprise is very important in Simone's book too. So I feel like I'm playing this mystery game, like find the element. Um, so surprise too is something that I think was a really important thing in Simone's book as well. In that I found that so often the element that was extracted from the canto, the illustration that emerged, the discourse that came forth between Simone and Roberto was not the thing you might expect. Um, I'm thinking of the frog, for instance. <laughs> There's a wonderful frog. Do you, if, you, if you don't have an image, I'll find the page and show it. Uh, I'll show it later. Um, so it, when we've got this like canonicity of illustration and commentary for the commedia and you come to expect certain things to be discussed for certain cantos, and then suddenly you find yourself with a frog, for instance, um, what about this element of what about this element of surprise? So I think the question of balancing the element of surprise, the extractability, <laughs> these ways of jumping in, um, and at the same time the big picture, because also Simone and Roberto do provide us with maps. So what is the experience between 
the reading through, finding oneself surprised by individual elements, and what is the experience of drawing back for this big picture, which is the map. And there are at least two maps in here, Simone, possibly more, um, where, where suddenly there's this moment where we come from a very small detail that is privileged in, in an illustration to suddenly a map that sets us the structure of Purgatorio with you know some commentary and breakdown, for instance. Um, as we can see, Simona is showing us on his on his screen there. So um, then, then to come back to the where we where I began with the exchange with Hollander, this question of what the visual does, because this this is in George's book as well. George doesn't have any illustrations in his book. Um, Simona's book is about illustrations as much as it is about text. Um, so we would think this is a point of divergence, but in fact, um, George has some observations about visuality as well in his work where he talks about the visual as being used for the purposes of preaching, right? The way in which images uh, communicate for pastoral reasons, right? Um, so this brings me to a lot of questions. Um, so basically when we set out how we would shape, coming back to structures for our, for our encounter here today, for our dialogue today. Um, we thought that I'd start out with some thoughts about both works and then I would direct some questions first to Simone and then some questions uh, specifically to George. So I hope I've set out some overarching um, broad issues for consideration that I, I feel do pertain to both books. I'm now gonna um, go from this uh, discussion of the visual to some specific questions for Simone, who's going to uh, to dialogue with me for a bit, then we'll switch over to um, some dialogue with George with some more questions that are more specific to his book, and then we will open it up to the floor, and we really look forward to hearing from all of you um, as well. So, Simone, um, I think in, in looking at this and considering some of these um, big questions we've already been talking about, there's so many questions that emerge in terms of, you know, actual, first of all, your response to your response to Hollander. Um, non tanto quello che la poesia di Dante dice, ma quello che fa. Can you say more about that? Because I think it's fascinating. I think it's crucial for understanding um, what the how what you understand the illustrations are doing here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, um, you know, this gives me an opportunity to um, Thank all the organizers, Derek, first of all. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, George. I'm looking forward to crossing swords with you uh, in, a, in the most uh, collegial and uh, um, amiable way. So, um, Heather, thank you uh, for, the, for both the overarching question uh, that I will try to uh, get to and for the pointed question about uh, what is it that a poem does. I mean, I insist a lot on this point. This is the reason of, for the book. Uh, we decided with, with, with Roberto that, um, I mean, there's a lot to learn from uh, classical illustrations of Divine Common. Divine Common is a text that gets illustrated right away. Um, but, and everybody uh, who does illustration of the poem uh, does basically the same thing until the 20th century, I would say, or the you know, late 20th century. Um, what is chosen as object of representation is the scenery, the characters, you know, the interactions, maybe, uh, you know, the narrative tone, uh, but always what the comedy already says. Um, which I think, and Hollander is right, uh, Dante doesn't want us to do that, <laughs> exactly. We should do that in our minds. Uh, you know, in a different setting, in a different talk that I've been giving in the last few, uh, you know, weeks, uh, in which uh, I uh, present uh, a project of, uh, uh, you know, a, a web project that should uh, gloss the poem with, uh, should provide an, an archive uh, of images, uh, not from the divine comedy, but related to objects that are talked about, described, or just evoked in the text of, uh, of the comedy as they were represented before Dante. So a visual archive to gloss the poem. Uh, so as I am fond of saying that Dante, when he asked us to imagine what is coming to happen in the poem, he wants our imagination to be mental, uh, not a process of drawing. So based on that, based on the notion that we don't want uh, 
to um, illustrate what the poem says, we found that we, you know we we came up with the uh, with this sort of pass, catchphrase password. We want to know. We want to try to represent what the poem does. Now, what is it that the poem does? I think in two words, uh, it, it situates the reading subject in front of the text uh, in an ethical vein. So, and here is where I, uh, you know, share a lot of, uh, uh, you know, material with uh, and intentions with George. I mean, my, my book and George's book are about ethical um, involvement. There's a pun or a you know, gioco di parole that was actually Fabrizio De Andres uh, um, from a song from May 68, in which he said that the refrain, the ritornello for it was, voi vi credete assolti ma siete tutti coinvolti. And it was of course political, it was uh, anti-bourgeois, uh, it was the notion that uh, you know, a generation, a new generation brings about a revolution, a cultural revolution uh, uh, with all that, you know, dangerous with that, uh, but also, you know, a social revolution. And everybody is, even if you think you are absolved, you are actually involved in it. Um, and you are asked to stand, and you're asked to take a stand. I think that Dante's um, poem, for the way it is constructed, and especially Purgatory, and I agree, this is the second point uh, of absolute agreement with George. Purgatory is an essential moment in the poem to do that uh, is about getting readers involved. Mm, the poem challenges you uh, in, at every turn uh, of the narrative, at every turn of the page. It, it gives you easy um, sort of moral quandaries to resolve and gives you tough ones. Uh, it gives you, uh, I don't know, uh, Alessio Interminata Luca and nobody likes him ever, I've never seen a sympathetic uh, commentary for him. After all, the guy is you know, uh, swimming in shit. Uh, and so that's very clear how to move. And then gives you Francesca and gives you uh, Ugolino and gives you Ulysses. And, and, and those are kind of situations that are more, um, let's, say, let's say more engaging uh, to negotiate ethically. So I think, this is, uh, you know, what the comedy does. Um, it positions the readers vis-a-vis -vis the text and vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, you know, the, the, the quandaries that are in the text. Um, so this is the answer to the pointed question. Now, if, if I can elaborate uh, and move it to the larger question that you were referring to, uh, the issue of paternity, the issue of guide, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what happens in this book? Uh, why starting with the words of a teacher uh, to, you know, to, to a pupil, to, from Bob Hollander to me, from me to Bob Hollander, um, a pupil who has become a teacher eventually. Um, and, you know, your question made me, made me uh, really reflect on what is the actual audience of the book? Um, it is everybody who wants to go back to school in a way, and everybody who is in school right now. Uh, you know, Dante is taught in high schools in Italy, uh, and uh, um, in a way, my uh, general, for me and for Roberto, I think we share this, uh, this design. Uh, our primary audience is, has something to do with the generational turnover. <laughs> Both Roberto and I uh, think we, we can play um, a, um, uh, a role of ushering people into the text uh, with their own question, new people, new readers, a new generation of readers uh, who come to the text with different questions uh, than what we could have um, and that uh, um, would like to um, Dare del tu a Dante. They, they would like to you know, speak to Dante um, as directly as possible. And therefore, uh, what we try to do with our crazy choices, for instance, of, uh, of illustrations, crazy choices of points that we want to make for each canto, uh, or based on the excuse that each canto gives us, um, are all modeling 
a way of engaging with the text that, that we think should be much more free, much more direct. Uh, um, we act as remover of obstacles. And that, at least that's my that's my job. Uh, you know, you always in each of, of, of those nodes, there is an element of explication the depth. We, we, we try to say what the text is about, and then we pivot out of it saying, okay, now that you have no obstacle to engage with the text, do engage with it. And I can model some of the questions, but I defer to your own new questions. Um, there's no way that as old people, we can actually um, come up with new questions, uh, but we can sort of model how we did it when uh, the question we were asking were new. So it's about generational turnover. It's about also an, an attempt to recuperate the engagement with the text that actually brought us to the text in the first place. I, mean, I, I, I do Dante, I teach Dante, not just because it pays the rent, uh, but because I love doing it. And I sometimes I have to remind myself why I love doing it. <laughs> and this book helped me to remind myself um, you know, about that. Okay. So would it be fair to say that what we're looking at then, as you characterize it, are not illustrations, though I might quibble with you about your assessment of illustrations, um, but uh, that's for that's perhaps for another time, a discussion of what we think about illustrations. But um, so would it be fair to say that what we're looking at here are not illustrations, but in fact, instead, drawings that stage a reader's engagement with the poem? Is that how, am I, am I summarizing what you're saying fairly? I'm going to jot it down and I'm going to say, use your words to say it the next time I try to say what it is. Yes, it is. It is exactly, exactly this. Okay. Um, I, and, think, yeah. I think there are discourses about illustration, the ones that are more strictly understood as illustration, that still consider illustration from that point of view as a reader in staging, performing their own engagement with the text. So, but I, I, I think there will be others here who may, who may be interested in speaking to that as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm throwing um, away the child with the water. I'm yeah, I, <laughs> I, I do think so, I do think so. Um, so uh, we're, there's gonna be plenty of time to circle back, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna bring George in um, and uh, with some more direct questions that bring this around to, to, to his book more specifically. Um, there's gonna be loads of time to circle back to all of this. Uh, so let me um, just uh, engage George here on some of these questions. So um, George, there's, there's uh, so much here that I, that I want to ask you questions about, but I think to begin with, um, with one, sort of a broader question that will allow us, allow us to, to link up to the kind of discussion we've been having with uh, Simone. Um, what, what do we gain, um, how do we, you, throughout your book, you talk about an emphasis on the ethical versus the eth emphasis on the political. And then of course we have the theological there as well. Um, can you talk about the way in which you set out the scope of your investigation? Um, and then tell us a bit more about why we need to, you, in your view, we need to insist on reading the poem dualistically, right? Um, that part of, of properly reading the Christian ethics of Dante's poem is that part of doing that is this way of also reading dualistically. And so what you do in your book is look at where you see difficulties in existing dualistic readings and propose a renewed way to read the poem dualistically. Um, and this, this, so you're, you're working with a tradition of reading dualistically, but you are at the same time um, speaking against another tradition that says we shouldn't, in fact, be reading the poem dualistically, that uh, Purgatorio, um, to understand what's really, what's really at the core of Purgatorio, we're going to need Christian ethics, yes, and Christian morals and all, of, and, and all of that that you bring to bear here, but we also need philosophy, and that Purgatorio is where these two come together really powerfully, and we need to be looking both at philosophy as well as Christian ethics to get 
to where Virgil and Dante together arrive and then Virgil has to go away once we're in the uh, um, once we're in earthly paradise. So I was just wondering if you might, and I'm aware this is kind of a lot of big issues that I'm throwing at you very quickly, but it does seem, you know, this is the sort of um, discussion that your book invites, this question of looking at big structures and, and casting categories. Um, so where, how do you place your emphasis and how do you um, situate this discussion in terms of someone wanting to privilege, say, the political or wanting to privilege the philosophical. So can you just give us a sense of the contribution your book makes in this in this area? Thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Heather. Um, and I'll do my best. Um, and um, like Simone, thank you to Darren Dai and all of you um, uh, for this opportunity to, to discuss my book and to put it in dialogue with Simone, because I mean, I love um, Simone's book, and I actually think there are lots of connections. And I'm pleased, Simone, that you started off with the ethical one, and and, and the sense that the the poem um, invites a response, um, and um, also the the general connections that that you weave between um, the books as well, Heather. And I look forward to to discussing those. Um, uh, the specific question, um, yes. So. I suppose it, it, it's easiest to put this question of the sort of dualistic reading in, in a kind of historical context. Um, and I think obviously if we just go back to the mid 20th century, um, you have that movement, um, uh, Bruno Nardi in Italy, Jusson in France, and um, Kenan Foster, I suppose, particularly in England, who amongst many other scholars, um, tended to make a distinction between what they saw as this uh, dualistic um, understanding of the two ends, the two ends, the dual ultima, of man, um, particularly evident in the prose works, the um, Convivio and the Monarchia, um, but in, it, to different respects, they tended to say that when you came to the Commedia, that vision was um, um, left behind, and, um, uh, and we're now in a more kind of theological landscape, um, as Etienne Gilson um, puts it. Um, I think, um, Theological uh, work, I mean, even on the dating of the Monarchia, makes that kind of chronological reading of um, Dante's works um, less valid, or at least questions that. Um, and so then you have this um, uh, approach of saying, well, um, it, it seems like uh, Dante was writing the Monarchia later, and if he didn't um, uh, leave that dualistic thought, we have to explain what we mean by that, um, behind, um, and if it's so central to his thought, you would expect to find it in the Commedia. And then you talk about the political reading of the poetry, so I suppose that immediately thinks, uh, makes you think of um, Scott's book, Dante's Political Purgatory, and he basically said at that point, yes, we can find this, these two ends in Dante's Commedia, and it's quite straightforward, the, the um, Beatitudo Huius Vitae, the happiness of this life, is found at the earthly paradise at the height of purgatory. And then um, the um, celestial paradise represents the, um, the happiness that awaits in the afterlife. And in taking that reading and, and the, the, the many other scholars, uh, scholars who, who did the same, Peter Armois and, and, and others, um, uh, he then saw the purgatory, the moral um, structure of purgatory as being through philosophical principles. Now, um, what I wanted to do, one of the arguments in my book, um, and this particularly chapter three, is, is I don't think that's right, I, I, um, for a number of reasons. Um, um, and one reason is that Virgil is, um, uh, enunciates the moral structure in, in purgatory, but I show very clearly that the whole material of purgatory um, comes from um, the practices of Christian penance and preaching material, and it's the seven capital vices, which is very much in the world of, of, of Christian ethics. I mean, it's not philosophical principles at all. Um, and so I wanted to say that on one, on one side, but I also wanted to say that, yes, Dante's dualistic thought is there in the Commedia. And I put this as the question. I said, look, if Dante um, is sitting at his desk or, or standing at his desk, he has a real paradox and conundrum, right? How does he represent a this worldly happiness in a poem which is about the afterlife? That's kind of a big paradox. 
And my argument is that he represents uh, this worldly happiness in the afterlife through the figure of the virtuous pagan. And so my, my, my dualistic reading in terms of those two dual ultima is that we find the happiness according to philosophy in the limbo of the virtuous pagans. Um, um, a region of the poem which is so central because um, it kind of remains with Dante right the way until Virgil's departure because Virgil is of course from the limbo of the virtuous pagans. So I think, um, yeah, if, that, that would be my, my, my first um, response in terms of the dualism. And then when scholars have tended to look at the moral structure of the poem, what I found typically was that they wanted to find one moral structure for the poem as a whole. And another argument in the first chapter of my book is that really um, we have different moral structures. And that in the um, Inferno, Dante sets this up in terms of natural ethics, in terms of the organization of his ethical material. Um, whereas in the Purgatorio, we move to this tradition of um, Christian ethics, which I particularly associate with the Dominican Paraldus, um, uh, which is a, di a, a different um, uh, kind of moral um, uh, framework. Um, and, and then how does that link in my view to the politics? Well, it's that um, it was necessary for Dante because he believed that um, we had these two um, ends, um, that um, philosophy was sufficient, natural reason was sufficient to guide man to his earthly end is part of his argument for um, the Holy Roman Emperor having um, um, complete temporal possessions and temporal power. And so it's important in terms of that um, political vision that he shows that the ethical system, the, the, the moral system, is in a sense impeccable. And I think, again, that's the, the place of these, these strange limbered virtuous pagans where they're um, without sin. Um, so, yeah, that's the beginnings of, of a response. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think there, um, there are a number of places we could go from there. I mean, one of, one of my questions that I often ask myself about contradictions back and forth between the monarchy and the commedia um, is, you know, do we need to make them line up? I mean, if, if uh, the monarchy is dualistic, even if its dates line up with the commedia, I mean, I'm not making an argument about dating here. He, he very often will do one thing in the Monarchia because it's a, a treatise with a certain pur purpose and do something quite, quite different in the Commedia because it's a poem with a different kind of purpose again. Um, I mean, we were talking recently about, you know, the example of Peter where his haste is a problem in the Monarchia, but it's it's a good thing in the Paradiso, you know. So, I mean, Dante switches material around to fit his purposes. The Commedia uh, can do one, I mean, that's a, that's a minor example, but the Commedia can do one thing while the Monarchia does another. I mean, this is just, again, just, to, to throw a throw a question out there, um, do we do we need uh, thinking again about systems and systematizing and trying to understand Dante's thought from these broader structures? Do the monarch how much the monarchia and the commedia need to align, even even if we find that the dating is you know this is not certainly the monarchy. Okay, fine, the monarchy is not a rejected project at this point. Even so, how much do they need to align? This is, this is, I guess, a question that I continue to think about for, for other issues as well. And I think it's, it's a really, really interesting one, not one to which I'm proposing any sort of final answer, but I think it's something to, uh, to keep thinking about. So um, what, I, what I'd like to do now is uh, for just another little bit before we throw the floor open, um, I'd like to provide another opportunity for Simone and George to dialogue between themselves, which they've already begun to do in really productive ways. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna open that up to the two of you to talk to one another a bit about, um, about your books and things that you see as productive points of, of dialogue between them. Um, and then we'll, shortly after that, we'll open to the, to the floor for sort of questions from, from everybody else. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Can I can I go first? Uh, you know, um, to really address uh, something that you just uh, um, you just said, uh, the the binary, the apparent binary uh, between um, 
you know, what's happening on the ethical level and what's happening on the political level. I think that George's book does, uh, you know, one important thing. Uh, I mean, I prepared my remarks, uh, you know, in, in, in my mind and on paper as, you know, uh, five points of agreement with his book. I mean, uh, how my book agrees with his book. And point number three um, is actually going to the core uh, of what you were um, articulating. Uh, you say, well, that there is an ethical reading and then there is a political institutional question and quality uh, to the, um, to the uh, to Dante's own reflection, both on the, uh, you know, the, the, the two goals and the two guides to uh, reach those goals, uh, uh, which I think George, uh, George's book does a wonderful job at bringing together without subordination, but just bringing together in, uh, in, uh, in dialogue. And I think that one way of having the two, um, um, the two aspects, uh, the two lines of ethical and political institutional thinking uh, that Dante explores in Purgatory come together is by, uh, is by considering, and this is very important in the time of pandemic and you know, isolation and individualism you know, brought to its utmost uh, uh, force, uh, is, is that Dante always conceives of both ethics uh, and politics as something that is collective, uh, as something that happens um, in uh, um, as an exercise of interaction between human beings, and you know, uh, Heather, you wrote the book uh, about transhumanism uh, in Dante and transpersonal, um, you know, transpersonality. Uh, what Dante envisions as the final status of humans after, you know, in the attitude, uh, the final perfection status is a status of interaction in which each personality is actually co-implicating each other. At the end of purgatory, he calls it this, he calls heaven, you know, a, a city, a, a, a Rome, the Rome where Christ is Roman, in which we are citizens, we are chive. Um, you know, Beatrice is very clear and, you know, it's terribly ironic, the slap in the face of Augustine, for instance, who said, you know, uh, Rome, it, it ain't the city of God. Rome is the city of uh, you know, the devil, the city of, of human. Um, Jerusalem is the, is the right city. But, uh, you know, that is making this very clear through Beatrice that he envisions the interconnection of humans, ethical and political, as, you know, as essential. And I think George's book does this. I mean, your book did it, uh, yeah, but also George's book uh, points to this, uh, co-implication of the two spheres. And, and you know, this is also modestly what we're trying to do. Every statement uh, that is ethical for uh, Roberto and for me is quintessentially political. Uh, and it is, you know, a cry for justice is not a cry for justice uh, just because there's someone in the desert crying for justice. It, it, it is someone um, you know, that calls to uh, a co-implication of uh, humans uh, in it. Okay, and I rest, you know, my case here. <laughs> yeah, I think this is where um, the the question of dualism raises interesting questions because Simone, you're you're saying, look, these these things work together, right? The ethical is the political. They are together. They are one, which is a bit of a different tendency in terms of thinking through. Um, thinking through the comedy then then emphasizing the dualism which it seems to me would want to and and George you also said at the opening of your book that you feel that Dante works through uh distinction right that he works through making distinctions and separations that's one of your opening one of your opening statements that um Dante does not read through, um, where I had, I had the quote somewhere, but I've lost it now. Um, oh, Dante's approach is characterized by distinction and separation rather than integration, right? Is the statement that you make quite early on in the book, which would seem to be sort of a different tendency to the one that Simone was just championing right now, if I may make things difficult again. Um, yes, I mean, I think, um, I suppose what I'm, yeah, what I'm meaning there by um, distinction, I suppose, is um, it's going back to those old debates, really, about the order of nature, the order of grace, 
uh, philosophy, theology, and that broader um, context uh, with the Faculty of Art, the Faculty of Theology, um, where we see in the 30th century, obviously, um, precisely the emergence of those distinctions between what can be known by reason, what can be known by faith. And I think that that is quite pronounced in, in Dante's work and um, you know, his theory of the duultima, um, um, I think shows that quite clearly. Um, and I suppose, you know, in, in relation to your previous um, response, I think, you know, one of the things I do tend to argue throughout the book is for consistency. So I think there are quite a lot of scholars who, who want to say, oh, whether it's Nardi, you know, he leaves that behind when he moves to the Commedia, um, but also um, people will say, well, even the early bit of the Epistle of Can Grande, it's got nothing to do with Dante. You know, so my reading, in, I think a general line is, is typically saying, well, I, I just don't think, in my personal view, that that Dante is someone who would keep contradicting himself or would hold completely different views at the same time. And I think also in the reception, the immediate reception of Dante's work, the fact that the Monarchia was used for the imperial cause in the Italian peninsula, as was the Commedia, it was quite clear that um, the Commedia was seen as uh, imperial propaganda in that sense, and in the same spirit of, of the Monarchia. Um, 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 so, um, 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 but I mean, just to, just to come to this point of, of, of the discussions, I mean, as I said before, um, one of the things that I certainly found so powerful about um, um, Simone's um, uh, new book is, is the ethical. I think one, one big difference, though, and as you rightly um, referred to, Heather, with mine, is mine's just words. Whereas what's so, I think, special about this volume is the, the deliberate minimalism of words. Um, and, um, and I just think it's so beautiful. I mean, uh, I just give this image as, as an example. Oh, so you can see this is um, uh, uh, Dante on the, the Terrace of Pride. And then you can see on the other page, you've just got the one Terzina and then um, uh, Simone's um, commentary here. And the Terzina that he chooses in this case is la qual fa del non ver vera d'ancora nascere in chi la vede. And from an ethical perspective, what I found so powerful about that, um, and this links actually very much with Heather's work on posture, is it immediately um, invited not a sort of mental ethical response, um, but a really affective response. Um, and particularly when you just see that alongside this very, you know, whole page physical bent over um, image um, of, of, of Dante. Um, and um, so I, I, I just think, I mean, that's something very special about this book. And I think which only this, this particular medium could enable is that it's really appealing to our senses. It's appealing to um, a kind of effect, you know, that we need to feel from the fiction, from the image. Um, a, a real suffering, and I, I think you 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 really um, get that. Um, uh, and it's interesting, um, Heather, you picked up as a point of comparison, um, kind of different father figures, and um, that as a um, a symbol. I mean, one thing I I was quite in, intrigued, you know, in the, in the following canto uh, when he talks about um, Purgatorio Eleven, is is the real emphasis on the vernacular of Padre Nostro, our Father and how that gives a very different understanding to pater in the Latin. It just gives a di whole different understanding to what, to what fatherhood um, is. Um, but I think in addition to the ethical that we, we've kind of discussed a, a bit, I'd just love to um, raise another point of dialogue with the books that we haven't so far um, talked about. Um, and that, well, and Heather slightly raised it with this, this question of structure. Um, but I think that the choice to just choose one tetsina from each canto, um, it's such a wonderful invitation because, you know, sometimes I thought, well, like with that one, I think, good choice, well done, um, I, I love it, you know. And sometimes, you know, you choose it um, and you're like, why did you choose that one? You know, so, for, you know, even in something like um, Inferno 5, you know, that usually people would choose one, it chooses a different one. So this. This, 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 this choosing of a tetsina is such a wonderful um, invitation, you know, to other people as well reading the book. It kind of makes me think, well, which tetsina would you choose for that canto? And, and that sense of trying to find um, the essence of a canto through a tetsina. And I think that's something I found reading through um, was, was really powerful um, 
about this book. Um, and I think it draws out a broader question in Dante's studies about thinking about the narrative structures of the poem. And obviously with Heather, you know, we worked on the bird groomings, but then the Lectura Dante, Santa Napolitana, has four cantos in a row. But this question of the Tetzina, you know, that, that it's such a beautiful unit. It's a kind of mini canticle because there are 33 syllables. Um, it's, um, it has its own, so many, so often Dante kind of curates a Tetzina and it has its own um, uh, kind of unique um, um, sort of self-consistency. So, so I, I just thought that was um, really um, beautiful um, as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of other points, but I, I want to, should I do another point of comparison or do you want to keep moving the conversation on? I, I would like to soon, if we may, open yeah, to the floor yeah. because I, this is around the time that Dara and I had hoped to be able to had be hoped to be able to do that. If you'd like to add one more kind of point um, to set us off, uh, please do that, George. Well, I mean, just the other thing, which just, um, uh, uh, just a little point really, um, but again, just linked to your father figures, Heather, you know, um, it just made me think, I think it's uh, when he comes to Hugh Capet um, um, uh, 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 as a father, um, um, which made me think of the father figure, and also Stasius as a father figure. Um, and I just thought another interesting point of, of comparison, I mean, um, you know, for me in the father figures with Hugh Capet, uh, one of the arguments I had there was that um, we need to not just read Hugh Capet as a kind of Dante's polemic against um, French history, um, but also in terms of his condition as a soul in the afterlife, uh, repenting for his sin, which is avarice. And one of the things I discovered in Paraldus is that one of the key causes of Paraldus, the key, the key causes of avarice, the key occasions of avarice is love of children. So it's where fatherhood in a sense goes wrong because you desire money and wealth for yourself, but particularly also to hand it on to your children. And of course, Hugh Capet handed on the kingdom of France to his children, and Dante sees that as a disaster. And so in um, uh, castigating his family line, there's also this penitential aspect that he's, he's, he's done something wrong in, in a misdirected love of children in making them kings in the first place. Um, um, and then, um, I thought um, it was interesting um, that Simone there took a different line, um, but he was talking about, um, it's not just about the French political system, but Dante is also um, making a point here about uh, the Roman de la Rose and French literature. And he's kind of, the whole kind of French literary culture, he's kind of putting to one side as he, as he, as he um, elevates um, the, the Italian. Um, and, and there's another similar thing, again, of kind of father figures, autobiographical figures with, with Stasius, where we both um, emphasize the, um, the, the kind of second Dante on the, the, um, uh, the autobiographical dimension, but just take slightly different um, uh, uh, approaches to it. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. And let's now open it up to the floor and uh, p f please feel free to raise a virtual hand or to write something in the chat or to raise a real hand and I'll see if I can see it. Here we go, Dai. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Heather, for, for, for mediating this and bringing these, these books together in such a productive dialogue. Thank you, Simone and George, for, um, for talking us to, to us today. Um, there are a couple of things that really kind of popped out at me over the course of the conversation. Um, one is just an observation. Well, one is, I guess, an observation and uh, wrapped up in a question, which is to, about where, how far, Simone, you were thinking about the space your text took up on the page in this book. Um, whether that was a consideration at all, because I was very struck by the fact that that the canto the 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 canto ten that, that George was just referring to of Purgatorio, there is one of the shorter text blocks uh, in the book, um, which means that when you when you re look at it, you read the terzina and then you are bowing almost down the page in order to continue reading. And I particularly picked that up because I was thinking of a paper that Heather gave, I think it was, on the on the WOM acrostic, where she was talking about precisely the act of lowering your head down the page, the, the embodied act of kind of penance that was in, embodied in reading that downward poetic device. 
um, which I think was possibly at the gesture com- posture and gesture conference in Cambridge um, many years ago. Um, not that many years ago, um, but but some some years ago. Um, and whether that was a consideration for you. And there's, there's a second question which I can hold off on if there are other people who want to step in, which I'd happily bring in um, further down. Very, very quickly, very quickly. Um, well, th- there is, there was some method in the madness of asking Heather to mediate these two books. Uh, we, we both learned a lot from Heather and from, uh, you know, the, the haptic dimension of, what we, I mean, what, what, what the reading of the poem uh, it forces upon us, invites us, but also forces upon us. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, my counter move uh, to Heather's uh, invitation to lower down our uh, eyes uh, is to raise them up, uh, uh, which, which is what I argue, I argue, what I propose, what I suggest, what I half jokingly have seriously suggest about still uh, about uh, you know what, what the poem asks y- your eyes to do once you end the reading of the can uh, of the cantica and the reading of the poem is to continue reading in the other book in the logor or in the you know in the, in the, the other call that God sends you there don't get stuck in the poem and you know still it means look at that they're up they're not on the page they're up there. Yeah, it's a, it, it invites a movement. So the haptic dimension, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, insofar as the, um, uh, you know, the proportions, uh, Roberto is a book designer and he is uh, very sensitive uh, to how the book should look, how much it should weigh, uh, it should weigh, and what was the relation between the white space and the uh, dark sides of the, both the illustration and the, um, uh, and the text. And we sort of decided uh, the proportions, the general proportions uh, of uh, each page uh, uh, at uh, a uh, meeting that we held in Rovereto, and basically in front of this, uh, which is the Kiriko. And, uh, uh, I found very Dantian in, in sense of proportions here. It's all in nine plus one is all a, a, you know, it's structurally Dantian. Uh, and I think that the column uh, of the column net, of the columnade, each column of the arcade uh, gave us a, a sense of how the page should look. Yep. And Roberto was unforgiving in terms of uh, a character uh, number for each note. I could not cross a certain amount of characters. Uh, and George, yes, the, the terset was a question, um, you know, that the terset is a thinking unit for us as well. And in fact, Paradiso 14 in my commentary is about what a terset is and is 999 characters, my note. It needs to be that, not one more and not one less. So it, it, there is a measure of, uh, you know, measuring the text by Thursday. And I want to talk more about, about that, you know, in due course. I Thank you, to, David, for that. No, I just wanted to briefly hold up, which I think, oh, yeah. Simone, you mentioned was the first image that that was was drawn for this at your first meeting, if I remember correctly, um, you mentioned it before the stream. Um, and, and obviously the text alongside it, which has, again, such a marked divergence from the remainder of the columns, but seems to very much be a kind of visual echo of the image that it that it coincides with and it's another very striking image where these yeah the 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 book design aspect is is so crucial and such a kind of wonderful brings such a wonderful materiality to the experience that's not just about and i think this is where i don't want to say not just about because i think this question of illustration is something we need to come back on and i want to poke at more when it, but, but later on but um yeah it raises some very interesting questions about this text image relationship Thank you. Uh, Leila, I see you have your virtual hand raised as well. Uh, Yes, (laughs) I'm here. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Heather, Simone, and George for today. Um, I'd like to share um, an analysis that I did about the relationship between text and image um, in the manuscripts of the Commedia. Um, also, I presented it at a panel organized by Dai and Federica, just to say. Um, 
I, I analyzed uh, the illustrations of um, um, manuscripts uh, from the Commedia from the 13th century and 14th, from the 14th century and the 15th century uh, man manuscripts from the 14th and 15th century um, compared to the illustrations from the same period and also the 16th century of Ovid's metamorphosis because in, um, I, I, was, I was focusing on uh, Inferno 25th when Dante described the metamorphosis, uh, um, which is inspired uh, um, from Ovid, in particular the metamorphosis of Cadmus and Harmony. I noticed that um, most of the illustration of the metamorphosis dealt with the moral meaning of the metamorphosis while the illustrations of the Commedia tried to um, translate into images the um, narrative, the imagery, also the um, evolving of the metamorphosis. So I was thinking, we know that sometimes some of the comments, the glosses uh, from the commentary of the Commedia uh, are translated into images during uh, um, the late Middle Ages and the early modern era. However, I think that most of the times, uh, illustrations of the Commedia from ancient times uh, are more focused on, um, you know, the work of art rather than uh, the moral meaning, uh, because, you know, it's a religious Christian work. Um, on the contrary, uh, for pagan texts, you need to underline also with images that can be understood by um, all the readers, the moral meaning. So um, after all these, these, these um, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, this is my idea. I, I, just, I just want to know if um, Simone in particular, but everybody else, of course, uh, already uh, thought about this, if he has some ideas about this, or uh, he intends to work on this in his project. May I? Heather, should I? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leila, for the Leila for the question. Um, okay, uh, if I, I mean, I, I, I think I, I followed your, uh, your point um, that, you know, that something that is, um, for, okay, that, that a text which is a classical needs an illustration uh, that brings out the allegorical meaning of it in order to rescue mm -hmm. the text from a crisis of inauthority. I mean, why should we read uh, these pagan stories? You know, uh, well, we should read them because they have a moral meaning. Let me show you the moral meaning in the illustration. Um, and, and you say, well, this does not happen for Dante. I, I, it, it's interesting. It's a very interesting point that you're making. Uh, I, I'm wondering whether uh, you know, the, your uh, argument uh, uh, could also be seen in the vice versa. Um, uh, let's see, a vice versa of your argument. You say, if I understand you correctly, you say, you don't need to do this in Dante because Dante, you don't need to allegorize in Dante because Dante is orthodox already. It's Christian already. There's no problem in, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in reading it. Well, I sort of disagree with you on there's no problem in reading uh, because there is a lot of that is not completely orthodox in Dante. And as you know, commentators sort of uh, um, uh, allegorize away when there is a problem with Dante. Cato's, uh, you, I know that you, you, you know very well these things, but uh, you know, the, the allegorizing of Cato was uh, the pivoting uh, move that everybody's was the flight reaction, not the fight reaction with Cato, but the flight reaction uh, of all the commentators trying to save Dante from himself. Now, my provocation uh, you know, for you and my only thought, the only thought that I gave to this problem uh, uh, relates to the vernacularity of the poem. Mm. So you don't need a, uh, I mean, it's not that you don't need a, um, a, an allegorization of the poem um, because it's Christian. Uh, it's already old, you know, old 
on a, in our quote unquote field uh, or can't, if you want. It's not just that. I think it's the vernacularity and the insistence on something that was kind of striking, both the vernacularity and the uh, uh, truth status of the narrative. They needed to be uh, glossed that way uh, with a non-allegorical, but uh, uh, with a sort of transcriptive, narrative transcriptive uh, um, way. So there's uh, a crisis of an authority. Why should we allegorize this text? Uh, uh, it's vernacular, not, uh, uh, not classical. Uh, and also it's a text that insists on its narrative dynamics as real, as happening, as historical mm. and so on. So, um, Thank you for the uh, for the uh, um, thank you to think more about this. <laughs> that I mean, for Dante, for Dante studies, it is very complicated, of course. Uh, but also from a history of art point of view, this means that the illustration of a metamorphosis in which two um, characters mutate one in front of each other. Um, we have it in uh, the Commedia's illustrations in the 14th century, while for uh, Ovid's metamorphosis, uh, this staple uh, only, uh, this, this representation only uh, becomes a staple uh, later on in the 16th century. So it's interesting for, you know, the history of art because, um, no, no, it's, um, it's a topos in the history of art, but it was easier for, Dan, for the illustrators of the Commedia to represent the metamorphosis that he was um, taking from Ovid uh, two centuries before. Okay, thank you. We have uh, more hands. Who would like to come in next? I see. Ah, is would you like to, to speak or are you putting your comment in chat? Oh, thank you. I, 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 was, you. Putting, I was putting the text that I wanted to refer to in the chat. Uh, George, you'll recognize it. It's straight out of your book. And it's, um, <laughs> you're looking at it and going, wait, that sounds really familiar. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's from the first part of the book. Um, my, my question is twofold. And it's both for Simone and George. Um, I wrote down an outline so that I could I could present it properly. The the uh, the other day, a couple of days ago, Simone, I'd asked you what you would like to see in the visual representation of the Commedia, and it was I was really thrilled this morning when you re-invoked the notion of um, the importance of what the Commedia does. Right, emphasizing the fact that illustrations um, interpret and translate as as um, uh, as Leila was saying, what the Commedia says. Right. So, so I want to thank you first for for that elaboration today because it, it's 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 what's uh, informing this question. Now, a um, uh, 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 a significant part of, of what it does and how it does it is through figurative language, right? So this takes us out of the realm of the literal of this is what it says and this is what that looks like, right? And so there's the, I can, I can imagine, um, I like to do illustrations myself, but I can imagine that uh, an artist would be hard pressed to, to convey the figurative significance right of of what is in the text of the of the figurative work that the text is doing right how does an artist convey metaphor how does an artist convey synecdoche right or metonymy for example right so we get a lot of literal illustration of what it says but i don't know if you can articulate whether you've seen examples of figurative representations of what it does, right? And, and, and so this is connected with the passage in George's book um, because it's uh, when I did the review for this book, which I will repeat once again, and excuse me if I embarrass you, George, is I think uh, just a, 
a, a, a, a, an essential book for any Dante reader's library. But uh, let me just focus on this passage and please allow me a little bit of space to read the entire passage so that we're on the same page. And then I'll tell you how it connects to the question about figurative language. Dante's use of moral topography at the macro level of Hell's Funnel or at the micro level of a ditch or river strongly suggests that he channeled his ethical agenda through his eschatological vision. Notably, however, he does not provide his reader with a map of the detailed moral schema that underpins his poem. Dante could have started his poem, after all, with a table of contents outlining the moral structure of each of the three canticles, but he chooses not to, deliberately withholding the kind of bird's eye view provided, and this is really important, by later commentators, especially in the Renaissance, and by introductory visual diagrams in modern editions of the poem. It is only one third of the way through hell, halfway through purgatory, and two thirds of the way through paradiso. There's a beautiful symmetry about that, yes? That <laughs> we find any gloss at all of the region's moral structure in life and even physical structure, right? So there's an overlapping of with the moral and the physical structure in those areas that you cite. In life, we do not have the luxury of learning all the moral answers before we begin our own ethical journeys and we learn more often than not through our painful mistakes. Likewise, Dante's poem starts not with a neatly organized solution, but in medias res, with a moral crisis, miserere digne. The reader, like Dante character, must plunge into the darkness of evil with only the shadowy presence of Virgil to act as a guide. In this way, Dante emphasizes the messy process of moral life rather than a set of prescribed rules. And he challenges us as readers to find our own ethical bearing. As Ezra Pound uh, memorably remarked, Dante wrote his poem to make people think. I so love this passage and I felt compelled to quote all of it because um, George's writing is incredibly succinct and economical. It's, it was really difficult to just summarize it because it, it seems that it's at its most essential. Where you say that he emphasizes the messy process of moral life, this to me is pointing to the fact that you're talking about what the poem is doing, right? By withholding this orientating schema, by withholding the, um, the preview, right, of what you're going to see, um, and, and, and how it's organized until so deep into the process. Um, um, the, the, this passage in your book, to me, underscored the fact that Dante is creating an experiential uh, parallel for the reader so that they might also not only feel the disorientation and the, 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 the sense of, of, um, of not knowing, right, that comes with life, but then also uh, experience the, 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 the gratification of finally having some direction, right, of finally having the, 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 the guidance of a knowing teacher. So, 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 so this to me is quite powerful, what you as a scholar is doing in emphasizing what the poem is doing. So bring the two back together, between the two of you, in what ways might visual representations do just what George does with his scholarship in pointing to what the poem does? Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. And, and thank you, Adoyo, um, for, for that um, reflection and, and, and for your generosity about the book. It's, um, I think as everyone knows, when they write a book, you're, you're desperate to have a reader you really feel gets, gets what you're trying to do. So um, I'm, I'm tremendously grateful because, because you, you clearly have done. Um, and I think, I mean, Simone was talking about this as well. I think in different ways, um, um, it, it's that balance. Um, uh, absolutely in, in setting out the extraordinary structure um, of, of the poem um, I was wanting to show how Dante takes us through this ethical journey and, and, and causes us to reflect back 
And just as Simone um, focuses our attention on one tetsina, uh, one of the big arguments of my book is that um, uh, we should um, consider moral structure as also a narrative structure. And that it's very revealing that in the inferno, um, very often the canto unit aligns with a moral region. Um, but then when you get to Borgatori and Paradiso, of course, it doesn't. And, and Dante is deliberately making it more kind of, uh, the, the, moral, more, the moral structure overlaps and undercuts the, the line of the cantos. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the issues of the Lectura Dante's approach to those cantos then mm -hmm. is sometimes you lose that sense of what Dante is doing narratively across a moral unit. And because I was focusing on the ethics, I wanted to say, well, look, what, 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 what is he telling us about the nature of avarice? What is he telling us about the nature of sloth? And I think you can only do that when you see um, uh, the, the moral unit as a whole. Um, at the same time, like you say, um, in outlining that structure, and, and I found that fascinating. I mean, even really basic things that half the poem, half of the Inferno, for example, is devoted to fraud. Somehow, you know, it, it's obvious, you know, that it starts in Canto 18. And so, you know, literally Dante gives half of his depiction of evil to fraud. But somehow, until you kind of look at that structure, you don't see that. You think, well, God, that's really quite significant. Um, and similarly, when I looked at um, the kind of topography, all these kind of things came up. At the same time, and I'm so pleased you brought that up, is, is being in my book as well as um, in um, Simone's book. I hope I've given a sense of exactly what the poem's doing and that um, we, we go into these encounters in hell and purgatory with these people without having the answer already uh, provided for us. And so we're, we're asked to engage uh, with their ethical dilemmas. And, and try and find our own bearings, and then those bearings keep getting readjusted at those different um, sections in the poem. Just to you know, second everything that uh, George just said, and uh, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, your book does, George, is to show how important it is to have a phenomenological approach to Dante's writing. You know, that Dante writes the text with a. Uh, uh, over a long period of time, and things change and change in corso d'opera. There are variances, there are moments of uh, self-reflection of the text, and so on. Uh, but what Adoya also was in interested in, and what my book tries to, um, you know, um, suggest, is that we need a, phenomenolog a phenomenological approach to the reading as well. So in the moment, uh, you know, we, we need to take our time uh, with the text. Uh, the text is meditative except in certain moments. Uh, and you need the interaction of both the confusion, the obscurity, the progress that you make as first reader, and the sense of direction and overall structure that you appreciate in retrospect. You know, the design retrospect is, uh, you know, is still there as an important uh, uh, core. So. Thank you for the question. If I may, if I may press just one more point um, in Simone's response, have you seen in your in your examination of illustrations um, works that or one, approaches yeah. to that? Back to that yeah. word, Heather. Works or approaches yeah. that yeah. that um, that up uh, that 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 do that 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 rather than simply illustrate what he says, you yeah. know, find a way of evoking what it does. You know, if, for example, um, there's, I have a very synesthetic relationship with this text. I, I actually sensually feel what, what is being described when the pilgrim is going through things. For example, um, Inferno 22 always nauseates me. Why? The smell of pitch is in my mind memory so strongly that when he starts describing those ships getting pitched, I, my gag reflex is set off, you know? Um, not when it's non, when it, not, not with generalized smells, like when he just says town for or miasma, like that doesn't really mean anything to yeah, me. Was, when he describes yeah. a specific smell, then I feel that, right? So, so this was the beginning of my, my, my attention to how mm. deeply evocatively experiential this text can be. And there's, there seems to be a barrier that gets formed, almost like a veil that's pulled over the text when an illustration says, this is what he's described. So have you seen illustrations that go beyond the veil or at least 
somehow managed to pe to poke holes in it? Uh, you know, at times there. I mean, I've, I've stayed very technical on uh, on this. Uh, you know, on this point, uh, um, the tension between the sort of the the, the plan and the vista uh, is something that different ages negotiate differently. You know, the 16th century, the the, you know, the, the Marcolini edition does play with this. Botticelli does a wonderful, incredible job at doing this. But you need, you know, 20th and 21st century, and David uh, uh, is, is an expert and a promoter of these uh, of these kinds of interactions uh, that are that really try to do this. Um, I'm, you know, venturing one step forward. Maybe the real uh, is, I mean, they did the, the, the limit kind of illustration is architectural. Is the Danteum, not the Ranis Danteum, which you know, which had his problems uh, for you know historical and political associations, but the notion of a space that um, multisensorially um, uh, stages the reading of the poem uh, and situates the reading of the poem, it might be the the final form of uh, you know the kind of illustration that you are possibly suggesting and. Uh, if you find the money and the funds to build one, let's do it. Or at, at least let's uh, start uh, thinking about it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a failed architect. In my <laughs> days, you needed to be able to draw, uh, and I couldn't for the life of me. But I really am intrigued by um, you know spatiality, the sp spatial quality. Uh, where does a sound come from in the poem, and how you can sort of stage it? Uh, it's so important. Does it come from be below, from above, mm -hmm. from behind you? Yeah. Does it? You do. You need to turn uh, and convert <laughs> and convert to it, as you know. Heather's wonderful Manfredi chapter tells us to do, uh, and it's something that that, that that the poem stages and gets flattened by uh, you know the, the way we read it. Mm -hmm. Let's build it and tell, or let's project one. You know, let's think about one. Thank you. Kevin. Thank you, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dara. Yeah, no, just you mentioned Marcolini there. And I'm just thinking of this illustration by Abbiati, which, you know, it's the uh, Giovanni Brito, uh, the kind of aerial view down in this kind of mappatura de, dell'inferno. I think it's, it's fantastic. I mean, these, these, these illustrations in, 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 the, in this volume are absolutely fantastic. Um, I was just thinking, I mean, I love this idea about selecting Terzina, what Terzina would you choose? And as you were all talking and uh, people were uh, having this conversation, it kind of opened out, I was thinking, what way would I describe this dialogue uh, as a whole from, and, and select a, a Dante and kind of Terzina? And I just thought of Purgatorio too, and that lo, lo, lo mio maestro e io e quella gente che erano con lui, per even si contenti come nessun toccasse alto la mente. And this, you know, genuinely listening to you all today has been has been a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. And, and I thank the three of you in particular. Um, I have a very brief question. It's for George. And George, you know, I, 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 I have a vested interest in the seven capital vices. Um, and this concentration in your book and, and ultimately, you know, and this, you know, the, the insistence on paralysis, I think, is, is, is completely right. But this concentration on, on, on pride, on, on avarice uh, and, uh, and particularly on sloth to the not quite the exclusion because you do they are in kind of incorporated in kind of under these umbrellas of these of these wider sins but I, I wonder could you just say a little bit about envy lust gluttony uh and, and wrath and how they fit in with what you're talking about um thanks sarah yeah and um yeah i mean i think it's it, it's a real point. I mean, you know, in this book, I do focus on 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 those three vices, and um, part of that was um, simply economy. I wanted to kind of set up in the first part the ethical and political dimension of the poem, and then look at the whole context of purgatory. And um, in the second part, so I then have three chapters left, um, and then I wanted to give this narrative reading of a whole terrace. Um, but as you say, um, um, uh, your book really looks at um, all all the vices. And then also typically the contributors there um, look at a vice um, like envy or pride across the whole poem. 
rather than just kind of as I, I typically I'm kind of focusing it um, mm -hmm. on um, uh, just one terrace of, of the poem. Um, um, I mean, one thing I I I really do feel is that um, the kind of comparative reading with Peraldus, um, I would love to have had more time <laughs> to do that. I think it, you would get the same kind of parallels coming through um, in um, Envy um, and Lust and Wrath and Gluttony. I suppose I was also, there's a slight, um, you know, one of the things which <sighs> points I made towards the end is, you know, it's very interesting that, that, that um, Stasius and Dante kind of just go straight through glutton, the characters of Gluttony and Lust. Um, whereas Stasius, who I, I, I kind of really point as a, um, a moral cipher for Dante, does 500 years for avarice and 400 years for sloth. So one of the things I was trying to say was that um, perhaps we, we overplay lust in Dante, for example, just to take one example. Um, um, and I think, um, and there's been a lot of, a huge amount written about that. Um, not least because of Inferno 5, and, uh, and so that kind of top off. And I suppose I was consciously not writing so much about that, um, partly because I think that um, for um, Dante as a scholar poet, um, or Stasis as a scholar poet, um, but also Bruno Latini talks about this, you know, lust and gluttony, I mean, these are really childish sins, right? Um, these aren't sins befitting uh, a mature ethical poet. Um, and I know that goes against the whole tradition, but that's my own view. And so, um, uh, and and you, so that's and you, why I kind of want to put so much emphasis on that. And you in the book relate that then, that this tepidezza back to Inferno 1. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so, um, so that's it. And then thinking, well, what are Dante's cardinal vices? And um, one of the arguments in my book is that the very first sin of Dante, you know, he's going up the holy mountain. And then he has the Pez Affectus, which links you back to the terrace of um, Sloth. But in Paraldus, I mean, it, it, it literally uses exactly the same image as that. Um, and it's about setting off with, the, um, with your Pez Intellectus. You know the right path to follow of holiness, but your, your Pez Affectus keeps you back, stops you going on that path. And it's just amazing because Paraldus literally says, you know, the remedy for that is to show uh, the, the pain of the damned um, and the blessed reward of the paradise, which is exactly what Dante does. But the other thing I mean, about from the autobiographical dimension, which I didn't think, I hadn't planned to be important in the book, um, but it's this overthrow by the she -wolf. Um And again, you think, what's Dante's big sin? But all the early commentators interpret the she -wolf as avarice, I mean, without exception. Um, then modern commentators say, well, Dante couldn't be avaricious because he's so opposed to that. And so one of the arguments I make is that, um, uh, 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 as I mentioned, that um, uh, this is one of the dramas in the poem that we discover. How is it possible that Dante, just having been overthrown by the vulgar vice of avarice, is accepted amongst the company of the poets in Inferno 4? And that that parallels precisely the moment when um, uh, Dante and, um, and Virgil are so shocked that Stasius, again, ethical poet, could have been avaricious. And so when Stasius explains that, that it was, no, he wasn't avaricious, he was actually prodigality. Um, that's also an explanation for Dante himself. So one of my arguments is, you know, if we think about the really important vices, of course we know pride is there, Dante tells us that himself. Um, but I think through Stasis, he's telling his other big sins, if you like, are sloth, which is associated with um, contemplatives. And um, particularly in his early, early years, avarice in its subspecies of prodigality, which is, of course, the extreme opposite. Um, but I think, I mean, it is, uh, it is still a weakness. I mean, I would love to have written more about the other four capital vices. And, and it's, it, again, it's a bit like with Simone, where you only got 999 characters. It was, a, it was a literally kind of, I, I had to, um, just the length of the book, that felt right. Um, but um, uh, I'd love to do that. I mean, and, I, and I'd love to see that happen more, particularly putting Proudus alongside those, because that's, that's what I found so exciting researching this book, was suddenly all these little details in Dante's text suddenly started coming alive um, in, in the context of, of that traditional of ethical theory. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so I, um, 
I, I think we're, we're planning on closing around now. So if anyone has a further burning comment or question, this is the moment to do that. Yes, Dai has a further burning comment or question. Okay. Just, very, just very quickly. Oh, sorry, was there someone else? So it was just Chris um, Kleinheit, hence as well. As Sorry, Chris, I didn't see you. Go ahead, please. And then we'll come back to that. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it's more of a commentary than anything else, but I, I really appreciate both uh, both Simone and George's uh, uh, comments. And Heather, your introduction was was excellent. Uh, I guess I'm, I, I haven't seen either book, and so I'm, I have to, I have to re rely on what has been said about them. But I was, I was interested in, 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 in Simone's book in which a tercet is used. Um, I, I often, when I was teaching Dante, uh, I would ask students to think of the secret word of the canto. What, is, what, what, is, what word encapsulates the, the, the essence of the canto or the mood or the thought or whatever? And that leads to, of course, surprises. And I was interested in, 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 in Heather's phrase at the beginning on the element of surprise, because I think we're all surprised, or at least I always remain surprised every time I read the poem. And when one tries to go back to one's first reading of the poem and try to imagine what one, what I thought of a certain passage or a certain episode, and having read it probably hundreds of times by now and taught it many, many times, uh, I, I always remain surprised by what I find. Something hits me, something strikes me. Not that this is unusual and uh, it's nothing that you could write up as a short note, but it, it, it is always, uh, it's impressive that we can still find newness in the poem. We can still be surprised. And I was also interested in the whole question of illustrations and how, yes, we move from a sort of a literal, literalist approach to a more, what can we say, metaphorical approach. And I'm thinking of Tom Phillips, for example, in some of his illustrations. And I was thinking in particular about the one that he has for, for uh, Inferno 19 with the Simoniacs, in which you have essentially the papal keys and the papal tiara, which transform themselves into a Jolly Roger the skull and crossbones of the pirate. And that seems to encapsulate what, what Dante is getting at about the rapaciousness of the, of the papacy and, and so on. And so you have something which is not illustrating those upside down uh, figures, those upside down clerics in the, in the baptismal fonts, shall we say, but something which, which essentially says what the essence of the canto is. And so I'm constantly surprised when I see new illustrations of the poem, which then do go much beyond the, the literal and which, which strike at uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, as, as, as Catherine said, the, the synesthetic effect that one has. She smelled the tar uh, of 21 and 22. Uh, and we can, we can, <laughs> we, we think also of, uh, of 18 and uh, the second Bolgia and uh, Alessio and Termine and uh, Thais and, and all of those and the, the, the odiferous nature of that particular canto. I think we can't, we can't uh, avoid that. Anyway, those are comments which I don't expect any response to, but uh, I was impressed by what I heard today. Thank you. May I ask very quickly? May I ask very quickly if you could repeat the name of the illustrator you were just citing, the one with uh, the Tom Phillips. Tom Phillips, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Um, I just wanted, speaking of surprises, I did want to show you all this wonderful frog, um, which I found to be one of the more surprising illustrations of the or, or drawing well, than you. Yeah. Of, yeah. the, uh, of the book. But um, maybe we'll let Di ask his question and then give um, Simone and George one last chance if they have any like last words they want to say. And then I think we'll we'll close our dialogue for the moment. Thanks. Um, thanks, Heather. Um, and just one was a, was a very quick practical thing. Um, is it reasonable to, to, to deduce from the, the file in which you showed us the English version of the emails that there is an English version of um, a proposal to Dante forthcoming? <laughs> very briefly <laughs> um, and second, and then the, the bigger question is i think something which which very much um 
I guess is 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 just is trying to ask a question that builds on what uh, what Adoya was saying before, which is this this um, you know is is there fundamentally because you know, the way we've been talking about it is to go back to the kind of Heather's earlier points about dualities, is there fundamentally fundamentally a duality or a dichotomy between writing about Dante and and drawing about Dante, or are they all part of the same process of cognition about a text which gives rise to different versions of critical artistic and creative interpretation? Okay, very quickly, uh, about uh, uh, the English version. Uh, well, uh, in the, the, what you saw was actually the original, uh, and what Heather read was the translation. Bob and I uh, corresponded, uh, always corresponded in English. Uh, he used to say, it's too late for my Italian to improve, but it's not too late for your English to do so, therefore we'll speak English. And so that's why uh, you know the original is in English. I hope one day we'll get to uh, an English edition, and uh, we have uh, ten cantos done um, thanks to Max Matukin, who is a, a student here at Princeton, a graduate student in comparative literature, and a wonderful colleague. And he tried his hand to ten cantos, so we have a pillole of pillole uh, there, and we'll you know we'll, we'll see if that if that happens. Now. Um, Reading, reading, it, reading, and writing. I, I let me. I mean, let me answer with a with sort of a joke. You, you need to look at the commentary and read the images. Uh, that's what is uh, it's all about. Um, for as long as you read the commentary and look at the images, you don't get you, you, you don't do all the all that it could be done uh, there. Um, and speaking of philology, Heather, I, I love the the um, you know that you insist on, uh, on on the frog because I, I I love the frog because I discovered, I mean we we did the book together, we closed the book, and then uh, while I was actually uh, rereading Contini, uh, I found uh, I, I found out that uh, actually Contini was speaking exactly of frogs and exactly uh, about uh, uh, that issue. Uh, this is not the one I was, uh, I'm, I'm on, and I published it on Instagram at a certain point, uh, uh, the page uh, uh, by Contini that, uh, here it is, uh, that, that talks about it. Uh, Contini in 65, in 1965 says, well, we should really rethink the way we do illustrations. You know, the co contemporary artists should engage with something interesting and look at that. He talks about a frog. I mean, <laughs> so I rediscovered basically I rediscovered Contini by insisting on that, uh, uh, you know, on that image. So that philology uh, in there as well. And now I shut up. Enough. Enough. Um, yes. So very briefly to finish with frogs, um, uh, it, it reminds me um, uh, one of my students is working on John Adams' Passio. And he was trying to think of the sound, he, you know, so obviously a, a symphony, he's trying to find the sound for the resurrection. And he has frogs croaking. And um, so it is also a bit like a butterfly, uh, a kind of um, symbol for the resurrection, because of course a frog goes from being one kind of being, you know, swimmer in the sense of being uh, a jumper and, and, and croaking. Um, but I just also wanted to um, echo what Di said about um, an English edition of this, because I think one thing that Heather and I found with the Vertical Readings Project is teachers liked it as a tool to get students to read beyond the inferno and the danger of reading, you know, that you, you get tied down in 34 cantos inferno and then you just get exhausted and you don't carry on. And I think, again, the economy of this, that you've got just 100 tetzina, but they take you right across the poem. And, um, and also, as Chris was saying, you know, you give a secret word for each tetzino or each canto as well. So I think it's just a wonderful resource to open up the whole poem um, for readers um, uh, and, and in, in a beautiful way. So, yeah. Dara, would you like to close ceremonies for us? Okay. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, everybody. Our, our, our thanks to Simone and to George for, for joining us today and congratulations really on these wonderful books. They're, they're really splendid. Uh, and if anything, we've learned today that there is a genuine dialogue, I think, between them. Uh, but I, I do want to thank in particular on behalf of the uh, CDSI, I want to thank Heather for doing such a brilliant job um, for uncovering the nuance and, and for masterfully guiding us all 
uh, through this uh, this afternoon or this morning, depending on whether you are. So thank you to you all. Before I let you go today, uh, can I just re remind you, for those who, who you don't know uh, about them, that we have two further dialogues coming up before the summer break, so in our spring series. So um, in, in towards the end of April, we're going to have Collecting Dante between archives and libraries, and that's going to be with Christian Dupont, Julianne uh, Simpson from the Rylands, in Manchester and Corina Salvador Lonigan from uh, Trinity College Dublin and that's going to be mediated by Federica Coluzzi and then our final dialogue for the spring series is going to be illustrating that this I think it's quite important that we're talking about this here and um, we're going to be doing manuscripts modern and medieval with Melissa Conway some of you will be familiar with Melissa and especially those of you who follow her on Twitter who every day puts out these wonderful images and of course, who is by now the, the world famous George Cochran, because uh, his, his, his manuscript version of the Commedia is making the headlines and it is, it is it's gaining massive following. And that particular one is obviously going to be um, mediated by Dai, uh, which is only right. So they have the two coming up, but I think you'll all agree with me if you join me in thanking the, our three guests today, they've done a wonderful job and it's been an absolutely fantastic afternoon and a great way to spend a Friday. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.